just before um, Dr. Manning gives an introduction is that uh, this is a student faculty dialogue. So the format is going to be I'm going to engage Ambassador Crocker for about 30 minutes um, in conversation, primarily about Syria, but also about the Middle East. And then we're going to open it up to you. So we want to hear your questions and get you engaged in this conversation uh, for the rest of that time. So get engaged, get involved. OK. Oh, OK. Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Manning. I'm the chair of the political science department here at Georgia State. And I am really delighted to welcome Ambassador Ryan Crocker uh, to campus today. Um, before I introduce you to him, I want to take a few moments to thank um, the people who brought him here. Uh, first, Chris Brown and Ambassador Charles Shapiro at the World Affairs Council of Atlanta for continuing to bring us excellent programming um, like this one. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors. The Political Science Department is one of the sponsors. The um, Global Studies Institute in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, the Office of International Initiatives, which is the office that uh, handles study abroad and exchange programs for all of you. Um, our own Pi Sigma Alpha Political Science uh, Honor Society and the Graduate Student Association of the Political Science Department. So thank you to all of those sponsors. And thank you, students and faculty, for your interest in coming today to engage in this dialogue. Um, Ambassador Crocker is um, dean, well, has just stepped down as dean and is executive professor at the George Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. He holds the Edward and Howard Cruz Endowed Chair. Um, he was the James Schlesinger Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Virginia from 2012 to 2014, and he served as the first Kissinger Senior Fellow at Yale University from 2012 to 2013. Ambassador Crocker has a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service. He retired from the Foreign Service in April 2009 after a career of over 37 years, um, but he was recalled to active duty by President Obama to serve as U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan in 2011. He has served as U.S. Ambassador six times to Afghanistan in 2011 and 12, Iraq in 2007 and 2009, Pakistan from 04 to 07, Syria from 98 to 2001, Kuwait from 94 to 97, and Lebanon from 90 to 93. He's also served as the International Affairs Advisor at the National War College, where he joined the faculty in 2003. Um, from that list of countries, you can already start to imagine the, the incredible list of interesting things you can ask him about. Actually, you can ask him you know, <laughs> probably just about anything, um, a sort of recent um, diplomatic and international affairs history. Um, from May to August 2003, he was in Baghdad as the first director of governance for the Coalition Provisional Authority. Um, and he was deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs from August 2001 to 2003. So if you think about 9-11 you know, forward, Ambassador Crocker has been involved in just about every um, interesting hot spot around the globe, I would say. And so I think we're really fortunate to be able to um, have this exchange with him today. I would be here all afternoon to, if I were to give you his full bio, so I'll just hit a few more highlights. Um, Ambassador Crocker received the Presidential Medal, Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian award in 2009. He also has a string of other awards to include the Veterans of Foreign Wars Dwight D. Eisenhower Award, the Presidential Distinguished and Meritorious Service Awards, the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the, Dep the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Civilian Service, and one that I want to skip straight to, because I'd love to hear more about it, is uh, the American Foreign Service Association Rivkin Award for Creative Dissent. That sounds like a fascinating award. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, if I may, let me leave it at that, so as thank not you. to take up thank too you. much of your time. And thanks again. Thank you, Carrie. Ambassador Crocker, starting with Syria, the numbers are staggering. Maybe four to 500,000 dead, as, as many as that. 11 million displaced. Half the population has been displaced. 10 million people in need of dire assistance, including millions of children. Millions are in refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt. Others have pressed on to Europe. We could, we're going to get to 
what's going on with the Russian-backed Syrian government efficient, uh, offensive in Aleppo, the Iraqi, Kurdish, Iranian-backed militias offensive in Mosul, and what's going on there. We'll get to uh, the president-elect and the U.S. role in this region, but I want to start with um, a, a bit of a broader question. And it ties into the many different fissures and fault lines we see in this really complex region of the world. Sectarian, religious, ethnic, territorial. Within that, can you tell me why the broader divide, can you discuss why the broader divide between Sunnis and Shia are so pivotal? Uh, well, thanks, thanks for having me here, and good afternoon to uh, uh, all of you. Uh, so I, I'm going to start by pretty much ignoring your question and talking about yes. what I want to talk about. Okay. You know, uh, uh, it, it is great to be here uh, at this university. Um, Dr. Manning mentioned your study abroad program. Uh, I, I hope anyone interested in the international arena will, will shoot to get into study abroad. And, and I say that because I did it. Yeah, even back in that day, uh, there was such a thing as study abroad. I spent my uh, junior year at University College Dublin um, and actually was just in Dublin to receive the um, James Joyce Award. I have to interrupt you to say that I take a study abroad trip to Dublin. And uh, there's several students here today that are going with me to Dublin. So. How outstanding. Uh, it, it changed my life. Um, that is what got me into the Foreign Service. I uh, never thought I could do it. Wasn't sure what it was. Um, uh, but I had a lot of fun the next three and a half decades figuring that out. So, um, so that's one thing that you didn't ask me. Another thing is, I just said Foreign Service. If you're at all interested in international affairs and you're in your senior year, take the Foreign Service exam. Um, all you have to do is go to state.gov and uh, follow the links for the uh, Foreign Service exam. It'll take one Saturday of your life. It's given here in Atlanta. Um, it, and it can change your lives and it can change America for the better. So don't think you can't do it, um, or even if you don't want to do it, take it anyway. It's another option, and if you pass, maybe you'll change your mind. But, um, okay, now I will deal Sunnis with and Shia in Syria. Yeah, well, here, here's, here's the thing. Um, this is an American tendency. We'll, we'll glom on to the headline of the moment, and then we will uh, spend hours conjecturing uh, as to what it means and why it's always been that way. They've been killing each other for hundreds of years. They're not going to stop now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, there is sectarianism in the Middle East, no question. Um, violent sectarianism? Not often. Not often. Lebanon uh, uh, is a singular case in point. Uh, but in Iraq, uh, during the time I was there, where you had mass killings of Sunnis by Shia and vice versa in uh, 06, 07, uh, you had to go back 200 years um, to find any significant sectarian violence in that country. Um, and that was like 1804 when the Wahhabis out of um, Saudi Arabia uh, sacked the uh, holy cities for Shia Islam of uh, Najaf and Karbala. But 200 years, um, lots of violence. It was not denominated on sectarian lines. Uh, let's just have a word about the overarching Middle East Cold War that um, uh, explains a lot of the day-to-day -day violence. Uh, that is Saudi Arabia, uh, the citadel of uh, Sunni orthodoxy and the Islamic Republic of Iran on the other side, um, uh, the standard bearer for uh, a militant uh, uh, Shia Islam. It's 
always been that way, right? Wrong. Um, this is why history is important. If you're trying to understand today, you've got to understand yesterday. Um, Vietnam, a devastating experience for us. Richard Nixon um, used it to promulgate the Nixon Doctrine. Uh, the Nixon Doctrine basically says, you know, the US is not gonna directly police the world. Um, the US will develop alliances uh, uh, with countries we can work with. We will train their military. We will equip them. We will support them politically. And we will look to them uh, uh, to be a bulwark for stability and security in their region. Middle East uh, was first out of the blocks. So who did we turn to? Saudi Arabia and Iran under the Shah. Uh, did they uh, fight constantly because it was Sunni versus Shia? No, they collaborated very effectively. Uh, in the 70s, the Iranians deployed a, a mechanized infantry brigade into the Arabian Peninsula to help the Sultan of Oman uh, put down a communist um, rebellion. Did the Saudis oppose it? No, they facilitated it. Uh, so just you kind of this is about power. Um, this is about governance or more often the lack of governance. Uh, fundamentally, it is not about a religious war. Uh, uh, when you do reduce people to basic identities, uh, yes, tribalism um, and sectarian identity become pretty important, but that follows a breakdown uh, of order, uh, not the other way around. So uh, just be a little reserved in leaping to millennial conclusions. Um, uh, and another thing, since I'm on a roll here, um, yeah, religion and terror. Um, so I was an ambassador to six countries. Um, in three of them, a predecessor of mine as American ambassador was assassinated. Uh, it is a dangerous line of work, but, but you'll get over it. You'll love it. It's a, uh, uh, one of them was the ambassador to Lebanon. Uh, he was assassinated by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Uh, uh, was that an Islamist organization? No. Uh, it was actually headed by a Christian Palestinian, George Habash. Its ideology, communist. Uh, so again, I'd urge you not to look at religious identities and uh, start talking about Islamic terror, Christian terror, Hindu terror, uh, uh, because it's just, it isn't correct. Um, and speak to the rise of the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Um, and the, and the, the difference, the, the fissure between those two. Okay, here I'll have to take you back in, in, in history again. If you're looking for one word to characterize, broadly speaking, what's happening in the Middle East, that word is governance, or more appropriately, misgovernance. Um, there have been a whole string of isms that have failed in the Middle East. Uh, it's 100 years since Sykes-Picot divided up the region between the British and the French. Well, let's look at those isms. Colonialism, imperialism, certainly did not prepare the people of the Middle East uh, for uh, responsible self-government. Uh, monarchism in countries like um, uh, Iraq, Yemen, Libya. Um, Arab nationalism, uh, Arab socialism, communism, just unadulterated authoritarianism. Uh, they all failed to bring good governance uh, uh, to the peoples of the region. Uh, now we have a new ism, Islamism, Al-Qaeda, and uh, Islamic State. That's going to fail too. Uh, but before you 
take too much encouragement from that. There's nothing out there that I can see that is going to reverse this 100-year-old tide uh, and produce good governance. Um, so if the Islamic State is al-Qaeda in Iraq 3.0, something will come after Islamic State that may be 5.0. But it is that core failure of governance in the region that produces Islamic State. Islamic State is not the source of problems. It's the symptom of problems, and there is no effort to undo those symptoms. So, sticking inside of Syria, there's been talk of the moderate opposition there, which might be the hoped-for group that might bring that good governance that you're talked about. Is there even a viable moderate opposition in Syria at this point, or are we resigned to Mr. Assad staying in power? Um, well, I, I am a veteran of the Lebanese Civil War. I spent six long years, uh, three as political counselor, three as ambassador, while that was going on. Uh, the Lebanese Civil War lasted 15 years. Um, the Syrian Civil War is that war on steroids. Um, uh, so if you missed the first few reels of the movie, um, don't worry, there are going to be about 16 more. Um, as, as all this uh, unfurls. Is there a moderate opposition in Syria? Well, everybody's fighting for their lives now in shifting alliances. Uh, uh, if I were to be asked to uh, identify a moderate group at this point, I couldn't do it. Uh, um, nobody's talking politics. They are talking war and, and fighting a war. Uh, so, uh, Here's what you've got to think of when you think of the Middle East. First, almost never are there good alternatives. Um, it is a gray, smoke-filled world, and your choice is between bad and worse. Uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad, you know, a mass murderer, uh, you know, deliberately targeting, particularly in Aleppo, civilian populations, hospitals. Um, but here's the thing. What's the alternative? Um, you want Islamic State running the country from Damascus? Um, uh, not, not a, uh, strategically not a very good option. So, uh, you know, when, when we said Bashar must go, it was an uh-oh moment for me because I was ambassador to Syria when Bashar came, uh, when, when uh, his old man died in 2000. Uh, and it was very clear to me that Bashar was no moderate. Uh, it was thought because he spoke a little English and could turn on a computer uh, that he had to be a westernized liberal. Uh, no, he was much more illiberal than his father, who had at least a, a French education. Uh, so when that balloon went up, I said, oh, man, you know, Bashar's not going to go. Uh, because unlike Mubarak or Ben Ali, um, Gaddafi, Bashar had been working for, and his father, had worked for about three decades to craft uh, the perfect security state. Um, and this goes back to 1982, Hama, when the old man trapped the Syrian Muslim Brothers, another pernicious group, in Syria's fourth largest city, ringed it with armor and artillery, and leveled it. Um, they got rid of the Syrian Muslim Brothers they also got rid of about 25,000 Sunni civilians. So Assad father and son knew from that day that someday there might be a day of reckoning. Uh, there was, and they were ready. Um, the Alawi community thinks it's fighting for its life. Um, they're not going to give up. They've got the Russians and the Iranians um, uh, now behind them. So again, um, if you didn't like the first three reels of this movie, stand by for the next 20. Okay, well, so looking at sticking with the tribalism a little bit, weave in the Kurds, and then go to the question, could the state system in the Middle East fracture? Um, it, it is a hard truth in life that there are more nationalisms than there are nations. Kurds would be an example. Uh, yes, they want a state, 
uh, but the problem they've got is that their population is spread uh, over four countries that can agree on absolutely nothing except that the Kurds should not have a state. That's Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria. Uh, uh, they all have an interest in uh, seeing that that doesn't happen. And you see some interesting manifestations. Uh, uh, Turkey has thrown support behind the Kurdish Democratic Party in Iraq. At the same time, they are fighting the YPG Kurds in northern Syria. Again, it's artfully done here. Uh, uh, the KDP is by far the strongest Kurdish party with a formidable uh, militia of Peshmerga. Um, but will they side with the YPG Kurds in Syria? Absolutely not. They'll fight them first. Uh, because they're doing some pretty good business with Turkey. Well, you brought in Turkey. Um, is the Erdogan regime a reliable NATO ally at this point? Uh, well, I have, you know, one, one of the great things of being out of government after decades in it is I can say any damn thing I want. Uh, uh, it's wonderfully liberating. But first you have to go through the government part. Um, so what's going on in Turkey? Um, since its inception as a unitary state following World War I, uh, Turkey has been an Ataturk enterprise. First uh, head of state, um, secular, allied with the West. You know, that's why Turkey was a founding member of NATO. Uh, but that's when the problem started, in a sense. Uh, the Turks consider themselves European, uh, even though most of the country is in Asia. Uh, they wanted to join the European Union. Uh, the response from Europe, pretty consistently, over a couple of decades now, as the Turks would put it, is, you Turks are good enough to fight and die for us in Europe as a member of NATO but you're not good enough to join our gentlemen's club, the European Union. Uh, and a lot of what you're seeing in Turkey right now is uh, the result of what the Turks see, frankly, is, uh, uh, you know, racially motivated uh, uh, discrimination and prejudice. So when Erdogan says, I'm going to look east, um, uh, I'm going to have closer relations with the countries we used to rule. I, I will look to the Chinese. I will even look to the Russians. You know, a lot of that is reaction to the perception in, in Turkey that they're not good enough to be European. Um, so we'll see where he goes. Uh, he is dismantling the entire editor process of almost 100 years. Uh, into what we don't know. Um, the thing with Mr. Erdogan is he's a brilliant politician, but somewhat less effective in actually getting down to the practical issues of governance. Once again, the failure of governance. So, uh, we will see where he goes. It is unlikely to be a place we would want to visit, frankly, unless the next administration decides to really invest in relations in a region. Um, uh, it's no coincidence, in my view, that the time of greatest turbulence and chaos in the Middle East also coincides with um, the greatest level of disengagement by the United States in the region. And the last thing I'll say, just to maybe get a, a little argument going, uh, for, for 60 years, the United States practiced a policy of small L liberal engagement or intervention. That comes out of the post-World War II American-led uh, uh, international order. Uh, we, we vetoed membership in the League of Nations after World War I. Well, we created the United Nations and the San Francisco Conference. Uh, we created the modern international financial system at Bretton Woods. 
Uh, that would be Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, not UK or France. Uh, we designed that order and we effectively led it from Harry Truman to George W. Bush. Um, you can certainly take issue with some of the things we did in the name of liberal intervention. Um, the invasion of Iraq was probably not our best idea. Um, uh, and there were other missteps along the way, but it was a consistent engagement. We are not doing that anymore. Um, and frankly, I find it interesting how much Trump and President Obama sound like each other. Uh, when they talk about those, those free riders in, um, in NATO not paying their share. Uh, when the president talks about um, so-called allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, this is pretty profound. Um, and again, uh, the, the two leaders sound very much alike. So maybe it is time after seven decades that a new approach needs to be fashioned. Uh, but before we get rid of the old one, we'd better think through the new one, how it's going to work, what it's going to work with. Because as we've seen in the refugee crisis, um, Europe can't deal with this. Um, uh, Europe is more disunited today than at any point since World War II. And I would suggest to you that has a lot to do with American leadership and lack thereof. Is that new world order wrapped around Moscow, about around um, President Putin? He would obviously, would spell out Russia's interest in what's going on. Um, Putin has played a really bad hand in Syria brilliantly. Um, they, the Russians intervened not because they saw an opportunity, but to prop up the only Arab ally they've got, um, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, so it was kind of a Hail Mary play, uh, and so far it's working for them. Um, as we sit here today, we may see the last rebel-held areas in Aleppo fall. Uh, huge triumph for Russia, for Iran, for Hezbollah, for Bashar, for the Iraqi, Iranian-trained Shia militia. Uh, you know, pretty good innings for, for Mr. Putin. Now, uh, is the Soviet Union back? Absolutely not. Um, I, I, I think he's probably at the limit um, of his extension. Uh, certainly not going to move into Iraq or anywhere else. They uh, reversed the fortunes of war against Bashar. That's what they wanted to do. So it's a, it's a weak economy, uh, as you know, in Moscow. They're not going to go very much farther in the Middle East. Now, if I were living in Estonia, I, I'd probably be looking at the acquisition of real estate in some other time zone. Um, and, and prediction, um, Putin will definitely test Donald Trump. Um, um. What about war crimes in Syria? Should he also be tested by the International Criminal Court? Um, the one we're not a member of? Yeah, the one we're not a member of? Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, it, it's a lovely idea. Um, but I think the way the politics are working on this kind of stuff, uh, um, it, it's highly unlikely. Uh, and tough to prove. Um, I, I've been involved in some conversations on this. Uh, one man's innocent civilian is another man's terrorist. Um, and it is kind of hard to, uh, uh, to tell them apart. Uh, you know, half of the people in Syria of whatever nationality are probably guilty of war crimes. But uh, uh, I see a pretty slim chance of, of ever getting particularly You'd have to go through uh, Bashar al-Assad, his entire government, most of his military commanders before you could even imagine getting to Putin. Let's switch to Iran, if we could, and, and how Iran's playing into Syria and Iraq 
and what's going on. I find it interesting that we're not in word, but maybe ostensibly on the side in the uh, movement on Mosul with Iranian-backed militias, though they say they might not go into Mosul, whereas there are also Iranian-backed militias working against uh, the forces we would like to support in Aleppo. What's the role of Iran? Um, complicated. Uh, th there was this notion in the administration that when we uh, got the uh, nuclear deal done with Iran, uh, that this was going to lead into a whole new era of relations in the region where uh, we could expect the Iranians to start playing nice. Um, yeah, well, that, um, that's not happening. Uh, what do the Iranians want? Power. Uh, they want to be acknowledged in the Middle East as a, a great power in that context. Uh, uh, I talked about the, uh, the Saudi-Iranian Cold War. Well, it's playing out in Iraq. It's playing out in Syria. It's playing out in Yemen. Uh, I argued at the time of the signing of the deal that as an arms control agreement, it's pretty darn good. Um, as a treaty of peace and friendship, not at all. And I, I had argued that the administration should push hard against Iran just as they're pushing against our interests uh, in places like Iraq and Syria uh, and Yemen. Um, we elected not to do that and in the process stoked uh, Saudi and Egyptian fears that uh, there really was a secret agreement between Washington and Tehran. Um, so, you know, they will strengthen their um, relationship with Bashar. The relationship with Russia for Iran is purely tactical. Um, you know, that's one thing we don't have to worry about for reasons of history and geography. They're never going to be friends, although they can find certain areas to, uh, uh, to cooperate on. And a final point I'd make there is um, how, how geography and history can condition policy. Uh, hard to imagine more unlike rulers than the Shah of Iran on one hand and Ayatollah Khomeini and Khamenei on the other. But Iran is still Iran. The Shah's Iran projected power through its army and navy. Uh, uh, that same Iran is simply using different means. Um, they're using irregular forces like Hezbollah, uh, like half a dozen militias they've created uh, in Iraq. Uh, you know, if you want to understand Iran today, understand Iran yesterday when the Shah was still running the show. Um, they are determined they are going to be a regional power of consequence uh, and woe betide anybody who stands in their way. President-elect Trump says he's going to rip up the Iran nuclear deal. What's, what are his options here? Well, uh, it would be good first if he actually understood uh, that that is not a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Iran. It is a multilateral agreement signed by the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany. Uh, so he can opt out of it. Um, he can't tear it up. That was actually Iran's plan A, uh, that we would reject uh, the agreement. Then sanctions collapse, they get to pursue their nuclear program, they got it all. Well, it didn't quite work that way, but now they're getting a second chance. Uh, because it won't be us walking away, it'll be everybody else saying, there go those Americans. Uh, as I said, the sanctions will collapse and they will have no um, impediment to resuming you know, a nuclear program. So uh, if we want to be isolated in the world, pulling out of the JCPOA would be a really great way to start. Well, you're quoted in this morning's New York Times as saying the U.S. leads or no one leads. And President-elect Trump has talked about safe zones and no-fly zones and tens of thousands of troops in Syria. Is this what should be on the table right now? Should have been on the table a year or two ago. Um, I, I have been publicly supportive of a no-fly zone. 
uh, both for moral and strategic reasons uh, in Syria. Uh, moral reasons pretty awful and obvious. Uh, you know, the target uh, for the Syrian government, the Russians, and Iran are civilians. Um, why? Um, what they've done is weaponize refugees. Um, you know, the constant attacks on civilian targets in Syria triggered that wave of, of refugees up into Europe. Uh, that was a boon for the Russians. You know, a weak Europe divided among itself, that's a really good deal. Um, uh, if you're Russian, uh, not a good deal if you're an American. And I, look, uh, a year ago, uh, beginning of October last year, I got a call at night. Uh, it was from the White House. It was a um, member of the President's personal staff, not National Security Council staff, but personal staff. Uh, could I come up next week and have lunch with him? Oh, let me check my calendar. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, there were only two of us at the lunch, Robert Ford, our last ambassador to Syria and a brilliant foreign service officer, myself, and the President of the United States. Um, there's a small dining room just off the Oval Office, and that's where we met. There were no note takers, no national security staff, nobody from the State Department. It was just the three of us. This was days after the Russians had come into Syria, uh, days after the train and equip program had been declared legally dead as we were trying to train the Syrians. And Robert and I thought, Wow, it's gotten to the point where the, the president is going to be asking some serious questions. Uh, we spent 90 minutes with him, and 90 minutes of presidential time, that, that is the most valuable commodity on earth. Uh, he took notes. We argued for a significant increase in the number of Syrian refugees to be admitted. Um, I pressed on a no-fly zone. Um, these can be constructed in different ways. You can certainly do it in a way that does not uh, put uh, U.S. airmen and women at risk. He asked questions, um, said he could definitely do something on the refugees. Um, we went out and Robert and I went out and had a beer and congratulated ourselves on how brilliant we were. And the president did not do a single thing that we had put on the table. Um, uh, so, yeah, it would have been nice if we'd done a no-fly zone right when the Russians came in and they were still not situated. Real hard to do it now. Well, the, uh, I'm going to open it up to, to questions from the audience in just a second, but I, I do want to ask a couple of questions on Iraq, um, which, of course, has ties to the conflict in Syria. And I, I don't think it's if, I think it's when Mosul falls. <laughs> Do you think the Abadi government will be able to reunify Iraq? No. I was out in Iraq late spring. Um, Iraqis of every identity, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, uh, they all took the fall of Mosul as a given. Um, and the question they all had is, then what? What do we do then? Uh, there is no plan, uh, or not one worthy of the name. The administration's view here is a purely tactical view. Uh, let's, let's just beat the bastards, uh, and then we're done. Um, we don't have to worry about the politics. Well, again, if we don't worry about the politics, nobody is going to worry about the politics. Um, so I, I could see the situation in Iraq actually getting a lot worse. Um, I know we don't do history well, but Afghanistan is an example. Soviets invade Afghanistan. We are resolved to see they can't stay there. So we spend a decade um, uh, arming and training the Mujahideen factions, uh, who all hated each other, but they hated the Soviets worse. And then when the Soviets were defeated, um, we said our work here is done, knowing that without a unifying enemy, the seven factions were going to take each other on. So they did, um, in a vicious 
civil war in the first half of the 90s, that came to an end when the Taliban took Kabul. What, what did the Taliban do then? Uh, well, among other things, they invited Al-Qaeda to relocate from Africa into Afghanistan. And that, of course, was the road to 9-11. Uh, many in the Shia community in Iraq see the same thing happening there, uh, where about a dozen Shia militias that thoroughly hate each other, once the common enemy Islamic State is gone, it'll be a run for the roses within the Shia community. Well, you've talked about the Obama administration being tactical. How about the tact tactic of taking the oil in statements like that? How do campaign statements like, we're going to go take, we should have taken the oil, play in Baghdad, Tehran, or Riyadh? Uh, well, that's what they've already expected from us, and there are a lot of myths out there that we did take the oil. We didn't. Uh, uh, that puts us squarely in the imperial colonial camp uh, in Middle Eastern eyes, because that's what they did, the British and the French. They took the oil, and they did. Uh, uh, so we're just going to confirm you know, those suspicions and beliefs um, that we may think we're a revolutionary nation. Middle East doesn't see it that way. They see us as the uh, spiritual inheritors of the British and French tradition of imperialism in the region. All of that said, you know, when I, I made several visits to the Middle East in the last few months, by and large, Middle Easterners were more relaxed about the possibility of a Trump presidency than many people in this country. And it was kind of touching in a way uh, when I'd asked that question, you know, are you worried about what he would do? The answer generally came back along the lines of, it'll be okay. You're a nation of laws. You're a nation of institutions. Uh, one man can't overturn the whole American system. Uh, it's not the reaction I expected, and it wasn't universal. Uh, but, you know, I talked to Prime Minister Abadi. He just, he laughed, said, look, if, if he's president, I look forward to meeting him and seeing what we can do. Um, I hope they're right. Let me open it up to questions from the audience. Yes. Um, in your opinion, what might be the effects of the continuous violations of sovereignty of Middle Eastern states by the international community on terrorism? Um, did everybody hear the question? Hey, I'm going to just sorry to interrupt. Michael is going to walk around with a microphone, so when you raise your hand, you just let, let him get there. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, define sovereignty, Middle East version. Um, you know, is Islamic State, uh, is that a, um, a manifestation of a new form of sovereignty in which uh, borders are irrelevant, uh, but control is what counts? Possibly. Um, uh, who's violating whose sovereignty? Um, uh, I think of Saudi Arabia and Yemen, um, UAE and Yemen. Um, where I would worry more about it, frankly, uh, would be a little farther east. Uh, uh, we, we, we should talk about Pakistan in case we haven't been depressing enough already. Uh, I do worry. Um, what the, the, there are 185 million Pakistanis and they have nuclear weapons. Uh, you really don't want to screw around out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I know, I was ambassador to Afghanistan, I was ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, when I was ambassador to Pakistan, yeah, yeah, we carried out drone strikes in the tribal areas um, and we cleared them with the president of Pakistan. And if he said no, we didn't do it. Um, well, the Obama administration changed that. Uh, they, they stopped getting permission. They increased the number of strikes hugely. Uh, I talked about tactics versus strategy. Uh, this administration, in my judgment, uh, uh, has attempted to make uh, a strategy out of drones. Uh, 
well, you know, it's a pretty nifty little weapon, actually. You know, it's, uh, it does get things done, but it's a weapon. It's not a strategy. Uh, and the collateral damage to a lot of those strikes uh, has been in our relationship with Pakistan and, in my view, their ability to hold their own country together. So if we think it's bad in Syria or Iraq, which had about 25 million people each, think of those 185 million people um, and those nuclear weapons. Do we really want to drive them over the edge of stability? Uh, Actually, their nuclear security program is pretty darn good. I, I, I was ambassador there for three years. I can never find the damn things. It's, um, you know, mm. they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, on the subject of uh, Turkey's uh, mission into the EU um, and the refugee crisis in Europe, would you say uh, that Turkey is not being more conscientious of European national security concerns because they're not being granted uh, EU membership? I'm seeing kind of like a cycle. They won't uh, be granted EU membership and then so they won't you know, close their borders or close their filter, but it's kind of a cycle that isn't being resolved. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, uh, very much like yours. Uh, um, you know, the, the Turks are also weaponizing refugees. Um, you know, the, the truth is, of course, since the uh, agreement between the EU and Turkey uh, on, what was it, 3 billion euros, um, and we'll stop the refugees from getting any closer to you, uh, a pretty, pretty stark transaction but it has stopped a lot of that refugee flow. Uh, now the Turks are saying the Europeans are welching on the deal. They've only got 600 million. Um, and, you know, they announced they're going to push for the death penalty. The Europeans say you will never get into the EU. Um, uh, I will come back to the point on, on leadership. Uh, there is only one country in the world that could possibly sit down with the Europeans, walk through this, and then sit down with the Turks and walk through it there and see if there are some compromises or understandings that are possible. That's us. Um, uh, don't hold your breath. It's going to be a long time till January. Uh, but again, uh, as I told Alyssa Rubin, um, uh, if the U.S. doesn't lead, nobody will. And again, we're seeing this, the Turkey heading into God knows what direction, uh, the Europeans coming apart. Uh, maybe that's okay with us. Um, but here's what I've learned over the years. What happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. Um, this is a global refugee problem. It's not a European problem or a Middle Eastern problem. It's a global problem. Uh, and if we don't take some dramatically different action come January, it's just going to get worse. Let me just say one more thing on refugees, if I could. Uh, I'm, I'm on the board of Mercy Corps International. Uh, kind of have a bias. Uh, we, we actually think refugees should be helped uh, and not persecuted. Um, uh, since World War II, we have had a numbered fleet in the Mediterranean called the Sixth Fleet. Um, so over those 70 years, the Sixth Fleet has come to know every current, every rock, every shoal, every port. We know corporately everything that goes on in the Mediterranean, basically. So since the beginning of this year, about 3,000 migrants and refugees have drowned trying to get from North Africa up into Europe. So how many occasions can you recall in which the Sixth Fleet, which knows exactly what routes the smugglers are using, how many times have you seen the Sixth Fleet responsible for a rescue of a, of a sinking refugee boat? I'll give you a hint. It's a nice round number. It is zero. Because we do know where the refugees are crossing. And we stay out of the way 
because we don't want to be responsible. You rescue them, they're your responsibility. Uh, so let them drown. Thank you, uh, Ambassador and Professor. Um, you mentioned the invasion of Mosul and uh, with the eventual fall of Raqqa in Syria uh, and the loss of all major territory for ISIS, what's the next step policy-wise, not only for the United States, but also for the Middle Eastern governments in defeating their ideology? Yeah, you, you are asking the critical question. That, that's the, you know, the now what do we do question. Uh, and that's why this worries me so much. There, there is not an Iraqi plan, there is not an American plan, there is not a European plan uh, uh, that everybody signs up to and would determine how Mosul and Moslawis are dealt with um, the day Islamic State has been pushed out. Um, uh, Iraqis are obsessed with this, uh, rightly so. Uh, but again, just like Europe wrestling with um, the refugee issue, um, they can't agree on a plan. The only shot at it would be if we were to convene all the parties um, and start working through this. You know, what do the Sunnis absolutely need in terms of security guarantees? Um, uh, and, you know, you can imagine the laundry list of questions, but unless we do that, uh, I, I am afraid that as I said earlier, that uh, uh, just as Islamic State was born out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, something will be born out of Islamic State that we can't see or even imagine, but it will not be good. Uh, uh, also, bear in mind, here's the structure we've got in the region. I, I wish it were autocrats versus Democrats. Um, well, that ain't going to happen. So I frame it like this. It's the forces of order against the forces of disorder. Uh, and we may have issues with them, Turkey, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. These are forces of order. Uh, and unless we can come up with something better, we need to start working with those countries to fashion regional strategies that will actually work. And key to that is how it comes back to governance. Uh, how would Mosul be governed? How would Nineveh be governed? How should Iraq be governed? Uh, uh, so unless we lead that conversation, which I don't expect, uh, uh, you will see the liberation of Mosul and the eventual liberation of Raqqa. Uh, and if the Kurds get any closer to Raqqa, that's all going to blow up. Um, uh, but you're not going to see uh, progress towards a political solution and the 100 year history of misgovernance will continue with um, ever graver consequences. W one other point on Europe and managing things. Uh, uh, back in the last century as the Balkans burned, uh, President Clinton took the position initially that um, it is a European problem, it is happening in Europe the Europeans have got to come together to sort this out. It's in their neighborhood. Well, that didn't work. Um, that finally got sorted out in Dayton. That would be Dayton, Ohio, the Dayton Accords. Um, only we could do it. Um, and if it is to be done today, we're the only ones who can make it happen. Good afternoon. It has been a common held belief that the Syrian civil war can only be resolved through the political process. However, with the recent, recent advancements in Aleppo, has this changed? Is military solution viable? Um, yeah, look, uh, it's axiomatic that um, uh, in an era where total war is unthinkable, that all conflicts eventually have to have a political solution. Uh, but military force can be critical at times to set the conditions for a political solution to come into being, which is why I was arguing uh, for no-fly zones. Uh, uh, 
fairly simple proposition. You simply tell the Russians, the Iranians, and the Syrian regime that uh, any time there is an attack that we judge to have been on a civilian target, uh, we are going to retaliate with um, uh, offshore missiles against a pre-selected Syrian, not Russian, Syrian military target. Um, I thought that could have the prospect, again, applying military force uh, to move to conditions where a serious negotiation might be possible. Uh, there is no possibility of a negotiated settlement under current conditions. I mean, why should the Russians or the regime in Damascus negotiate? They're on a roll. Uh, so you got to change their thinking, and military action can be very important to that. It's not a solution in and of itself, but it can create conditions where a solution is possible. Uh, and, you know, frankly, if we, if we weren't going to intervene up to this point, uh, we sure as heck aren't going to intervene once um, uh, Aleppo has fallen back into regime hands. It's, uh, it's pretty breathtakingly tragic, um, but it is the way it is. Might have time for one more question. Thank you, Ambassador. Just sort of a logistical question. Why is the uh, American embassy in Iraq the size of the Vatican, with um, some estimates saying about nine to 16,000 personnel? How many? Nine to 16. Um, it was built big because we thought that post-Saddam, we would have a range of interests in Iraq uh, its economic and political development, uh, perhaps as a linchpin for a, um, uh, a new Middle Eastern security condominium. Uh, we generally go the opposite way. We, we build installations too small and then have to add on. Uh, so uh, that was the thinking, that uh, uh, we would have a lot of people in Iraq uh, working pretty hard to uh, see Iraq transformed from the region's perennial bad boy um, into a very constructive force. Obviously, it hadn't worked out that way, but um, um, that was the thinking. We, we actually have time for a couple more questions, and I have one that gets us into a, a, maybe a different area. I had the Islamic State used social media extensively, and we have fought hard to shut social media down. My question is broader, though. Given throughout your career, how has globalization and social media changed diplomacy? Um, yeah, it is a good question. I, I would say the answer is probably very much still in uh, formulation stage. We don't know. Uh, uh, I, I do know that it drives official spokesmen nuts uh, because it's, it's, it's 24 hours. Uh, and the most outrageous things said on social media are taken by a number of people as absolutely true. So it's just tougher and tougher for governments and their representatives to keep a story coherent, uh, to keep a focus on larger goals uh, because you got to be alert and responding in, in real time. Uh, we've all seen the fake news saying, uh, do you have a school of journalism here? Uh, yeah. Communications, yes. Communications, so Thanks yeah. for the word, yeah. Um, and this all comes at a time when uh, the commitment to international news is, is almost non-existent. Um, when I was in Beirut in the early 80s, everybody had a bureau. You know, all the channels, all the newspapers, those are all gone. Um, so the technical ability to communicate uh, has expanded exponentially through social media. Uh, the content is more mindless than ever. Uh, so just trying to sort out true from false, uh, uh, real versus imagined, uh, it's all happening in real time um, and our capacity to understand 
you know, what is real and what isn't uh, uh, is incredibly weak. Um, so a number of, or a majority of the foreign fighters for Islamic State um, come from Tunisia because of economic reasons, um, because the Islamic State will offer several hundred dollars if you have a family. Um, so should the international community just focus on humanitarian aid to these countries that the foreign fighters are coming from so they stop recruiting from these people? Yeah, the, the Tunisian phenomenon is, uh, is really interesting. Uh, it's, it's not just Islamic State. Uh, it, it's also Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, you know, a hugely disproportionate number of, of Tunisians involved in this, and not just as foot soldiers. Uh, uh, so how do you fix it? Uh, well, in our experience in Mercy Corps, uh, you know, we look at sources of radicalization. Uh, much to our surprise, it turned out that economics were not the hinge pin on this. Subsumed in something else, and, you know, that's dignity, pride. Uh, having a job certainly helps in the pride department, uh, but you've got a lot of young, reasonably well-educated Tunisians uh, who feel they have no prospects, no opportunities, and they are not respected. Uh, so when Islamic State or Al-Qaeda says, here's your AK, um, you can hold up your head as a proud Muslim, that's going to resonate. Um, uh, Tunisia, incidentally, uh, is the one semi-bright spot in this uh, uh, region of conflict. Uh, they actually have had two successful elections, and I'm on another uh, board um, and we just had a meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're, we're putting everything we've got into Tunisia because we think they might actually turn the corner there. So you got that contradiction. Uh, uh, but the, the, the sooner the Tunisians can move into stable democracy, the sooner I think you're going to see that um, line of applicants start to uh, reduce itself. What is the role of the Foreign Service um, in a country whose president has the animating vision of America first? Do you see the diplomacy shrinking, changing its mission from alliance building and democracy promotion to, to something else? Does the State Department shrink? What happens next? Um. Well, I'm glad you asked, because uh, I get to reiterate my pitch. Um, you know, go join the Foreign Service and find out. It's a, uh, the entire Foreign Service of the United States, diplomats, if you will, it's about 8,200 people. Um, uh, that's a little bit less than a single carrier battle group with its air wing embarked. Uh, so we're pretty cheap. Um, uh, and we're pretty loyal. Uh, it, it's a two-fold effort, and I've been involved in these things. Uh, uh, in the run-up to Iraq, I was spending a lot of time making a lot of enemies in Washington by setting out why this might not be a spectacularly good idea. Um, we went in, and two weeks, after, ten days after the fall of Saddam's statue, in Baghdad, I was there. Uh, and I was there to do everything I could think of to make this go right. Um, and I, I think the Foreign Service will have a similar uh, challenge with the new administration. Uh, first, persuasion, explaining why engagement is important, how it works, what it costs. Uh, make the case that no one leads in this world if if, if we don't, and see if you can convince the new administration that now that they're in power, they might want to get beyond election sloganeering. But whatever they do, uh, once the decision is made, the Foreign Service, like our military services, uh, you got to salute and say, yes, sir, 
we got it, we'll carry it forward. And if you can't do that, you've got to resign. I mean, uh, uh, you know, there are some who will say, well, I'll stay in and try and subvert it. It's treasonous in my view. Um, so, again, we all voted different ways. Um, any of you who didn't vote, you deserve what you get. Uh, um, but that election is over. That election is over. We have got just one president elect for the next at least four years. And I think as an American, we all have a responsibility to do anything we can um, to help him succeed. And a lot of that effort is explaining to someone who has not much experience in federal government what the federal government can do and why. Uh, I am waiting impatiently to see what uh, the selection is for Secretary of State. I think it's going to be pretty important. Um, uh, but, but again, any president has to be able to look at his foreign service or her foreign service, darn, uh, uh, and see them as absolutely loyal to an elected political leadership, just like their military. I mean, nobody elects foreign service officers. Uh, we're a democracy, the people speak, uh, uh, that has been done, and we can't undo it. Um, uh, all we can do is move forward uh, and, and hope that uh, in an increasingly complex world, the president will make the right choices, but he will make the choices. Um, we used to, this old, I guess this is our last question, but I, we used to not be able to talk about the Middle East without talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict and not a single question about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Yesterday in the New York Times, President Carter um, argued that we should give full diplomatic rec recognition to Palestine um, and help it gain UN membership. Good idea? No. Uh, um, you know, this, this has to be negotiated. Uh, uh, you don't hear much about the Israeli-Palestine uh, uh, dilemma because there's so much else out there overshadowing it uh, and because, frankly, there isn't much to talk about. Uh, you know, neither administration, um, uh, you know, not in the Palestinian territories, not in Israel, uh, is ready for a serious conversation on uh, what may be next. Uh, a couple of months ago, the Saudis uh, reiterated their support for um, uh, the two-state solution called the Fahad Plan. Uh, I found that significant uh, because, again, there's nothing, no immediate huge burning crisis like we're seeing in Syria, but that the Saudis would see that worth reaffirming. I, I, I've been about nothing but bad news, so I'll give you one tiny bit of good news. Um, uh, Israel and the Arabs. Um, uh, arguably, the Israelis and the Saudis uh, are seeing the region for the first time in much the same way. Uh, somehow, Netanyahu and Erdogan managed to put their relationship back together that um, uh, virtually was sundered when the Israelis attacked a sort of a peace convoy out in the Mediterranean. Um, so there, there is, and um, I, I saw Sisi in New York during the General Assembly and he bounded into the room and said, I want to thank you, Sisi uh, uh, of Egypt. Uh, uh, this was a time in which um, his gratitude to the United States was uh, not terribly significant. He was really mad at us. So I said, why, sir? He said, because of the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. We never could have done that without American involvement. And it is now the bedrock of Egypt's national security. So thank you. Then he said, and I have to expre express a real regret, um, which is, I actually have a better relationship with Israel than I do with the United States. Um, so there is some quiet stuff 
going on out there uh, uh, that when the time is right could bring you back to a different political dynamic um, uh, that would favor um, a negotiated settlement. Uh, you know, I have huge respect for um, uh, President Carter. Actually, I've had this conversation with him more than once. Uh, 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 idealism is, is a great quality, but not if it's at the expense of practical political solutions. Uh, um, so I, I, I would urge that we not take such a step right now. Could everybody join me in thanking Ambassador Crocker for such a fascinating conversation? We, we do have food for a short reception, and he's able to join us for a short while, so please join us out in the lobby. Go take the foreign service exam. Go take the foreign study abroad. Thank you so much. That was great. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, take <laughs> that makes me feel better. Yeah. All right. One, two, three. Just one more.